becomes one body with her. Scripture says, the two shall become one flesh. But whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun lewd conduct. Every other sin a man commits is outside his body. But the fornicator sins against his own body. You must know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is within the spirit you have received from God. You are not your own. You have been purchased at a price. So glorify God in your body. The Lord told this parable. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that is coming to me. So the father divided up the property. Some days later, this younger son collected all his belongings and went off to a distant land where he squandered his money on dissolute living. After he had spent everything, a great famine broke out in the country, and he was in dire need. So he attached himself to one of the property class of the place, who sent him to his farm to take care of the pigs. He longed to fill his belly with the husks that were fodder for the pigs, but no one made a move to give him anything. Coming to his senses at last, he said, how many hired hands at my father's place have more than enough to eat, while here I am starving? I will break away and return to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. With that he set off for his father's house. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was deeply moved. He ran out to meet him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. The father said to his servants, Quick, bring out the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Take the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. Then the celebration began. Meanwhile, the elder son was out on the land. As he neared the house on his way home, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked him the reason for the dancing and the music. The servant answered, Your brother is home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back in good health. The son grew angry at this and would not go in, but his father came out and began to plead with him. He said to his father in reply, For years now I have slaved for you. I never disobeyed one of your orders, yet you never gave me so much as a kid yoke to celebrate with my friends. Then when this son of yours returns after having gone through your property with loose women, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, replied the father, you are with me always, and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and rejoice. This brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. Glory to
But the Jews, the Pharisees, and scribes were angry because Jesus had the temerity to sit down with the sinner. And so Jesus, in response to this, told them several stories. The three that he told in a row in chapter 15 of Luke were the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep to look for the one lost sheep. The woman who loses a very small coin, and when she finds it, that throws a big party because she found it. She probably spent more on the party than the coin was worth. And then the story of the prodigal son. He is lost and is now found. What we're looking at is coming back to the Father, coming back to God. The fathers of the church in the early centuries said that in the soul's mind, there is a memory of paradise, of living in the garden, living with God. This is what the prodigal son's story is about. <clears throat> Following that inclination, that memory, back to where he needs to be. And Jesus uses this story to help us understand. Imagine us sitting before Jesus, preaching from some stone or chair, and telling us about this prodigal son. Well, actually, there's two prodigal sons here. Prodigal means wasteful, extravagance, wasting what you have. And it's obvious that the younger son does this. He has his own dreams. He believes in his own wisdom. And he goes to a far country and leaves behind all that he's been brought up with, all of his ideals the things that he should be doing. But the other son is a prodigal too, and that's, that's one of the teachings of this gospel. It's not just because you waste things obviously like that. The, the older son apparently lived near or with the father. He worked on the farm. What does the father say to the other son when he gets angry over his younger brother coming back and being welcomed. You have me always. Everything I have is yours. This older son had just as much of a worldview as his younger son. Everything revolved around him. What I deserve. What I need. What's mine from the Father. And so, we have to understand that being wasteful, being prodigal happens in many, many different ways. Sometimes, like the elder son, he's distant from the father, not in geography or miles, but he's distant because he's distant in spirit. He can be just as much a prodigal as that. So what we have here is, the story focusing now on the younger son who realizes that he's lost everything he had. Why? Because of famine. But there's another thing that he lost. There's a famine inside his own soul because he realizes that he lacks that faith. He lacks that morality, his ethics. Gave this all away for the kind of living that he lived in this far country. And so there's a conversion that occurs in the younger son. And this is the conversion that is the message for you and me. He finds himself, he now understands who his father, i.e., God, and who himself is. He understands what his relationship is with his father. And now he makes a change. It's a change in heart, but it's a change in direction. Because what does he do now? He says, ah, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go work for my father. At 
least he has the thought of going back to his father. And what he does is he understands that now I must return home where I belong. So what's the message for you and me? I think the message is we need to imagine ourselves as the prodigal son. Listen to the words of the Kitanya. We're not saying the prodigal son was this way. We use present personal I. When I foolishly spurned your fatherly glory, I squandered the rest riches you had given to me on evil deeds. So now I cry out to you with the voice of the prodigal son. You and I are to find ourselves the same way. I have sinned against you, O merciful Father. Accept my repentance and treat me as one of your highest servants. When we sing this Kitanya, we are singing on behalf of ourselves, not the prodigal son. We have wasted gifts given to us. We have distanced ourselves from God the Father. This is a good stepping stone for our own preparation for Lent, which is coming up in a few short weeks. Lent is a journey to the mercy of the Father. It's not an adventure in self-development or preparation to do what's right. We have to understand we can't do it ourselves. So the message for us is, in preparation for Lent, think about this journey that you and I must make, should make, to the Father, to His mercy. And that we owe Him that respect and that understanding of what our position is with Him. That we all <coughs> to go back to the home that was made for us, paradise, be with God. That's where we have to focus our attention to. Because the message of this gospel and the message of the entire Lenten season is repentance and return. We have been lost through our own sin. We've exiled ourselves from God. And now we need to think about returning. Returning where? To the Father. To the home. So listen to the gospel. It says he, he saw the person his son far off. Apparently he was actually waiting for him to come back. And that's what God does for each one of us. Waits for us to come back. And the season of great land which is coming up is the season what we should think about returning to the Father truly. Home is where the heart is. We have to examine our own self. What am I focusing on in my life? What am I doing in my life? Am I going home? <clears throat> or am I still distancing myself from God the Father? If our goal isn't home, then what is it? As I was preparing this homily, it just came to me out of the blue. Even in the secular world, talk about coming home. In Greek mythology, there's a story about Odysseus and his various travels in the Greek world. But what does he do? He comes back home to Ithaca, where he came from. But even more recently, because I think most of us are the age that we've watched the movie, maybe even read the book, to his book, but watched the movie Wizard of Oz. When Dorothy finally comes home, after all of her adventures, whether they were a dream or real, what's the last thing she says? There's no place like home. And that's what she wants you to be home. This side.